Lord, one, this is Timothy Mark with Alexandria. How's everybody doing today? And this is the Tickle Trunk of Horror Show. And today we have a special guest for you, Tommy McLaughlin. Tommy McLaughlin is an actor, or was an actor in the 70s, and uh, still, I guess, in some of the music videos for the Sloths, you can consider him an actor in some of that. But uh, he's a, a screenwriter, a writer, a director, and he, as I just said, the lead singer for the Sloths. And uh, he will be joining us today. Some of his films include Friday 13th Part 6, and then a Stephen King film, Sometimes They Come Back. And then he's done um, At Risk, Unsaid. Um, He's done a lot of movies and a lot of uh, uh, television shows. So uh, definitely going to be glad to have him join us on today's show. But before we get into that, uh, our theme song there was uh, by Ryan Daughtery out of the UK. Uh, that was our Tickle Trunk of Horrors theme song. So we thank him for that. Um, so we're going to get into uh, the media showers that's coming up. Apparently, uh, this weekend's meteor shower really could be the best one of the year. And uh, we really have to, uh, we actually have the moon to thank for that. And uh, from August 11th to August 13th, the Presidit meteor shower will send between, they're saying roughly between 60 and 70 meteors shooting across the sky every single hour. And uh, the meteor shower's peak is expected to occur the night of Sunday, August 12th, into the wee hours of Monday morning. And it's really said to be particular spectacular. And uh, this uh, Persetis happens every year. But this year's crescent moon will make the sky darker and uh, when the sky is darker this will really allow the meteors to really shine in all their glory and uh, again the moon is very favorable for uh, the meteor shower this year and it'll actually make uh, this meteor shower the best shower of 2008 for people who want to go out and view it and uh, this is what a NASA meteor expert Bill Cook uh, told uh, space.com so if you really get a chance uh, to get out and watch some of the meteors and uh, for people that live in areas with little light pollution you will be able to see the meteor shower at its best yeah yeah it's the kind of shower you actually don't want to hit you so yeah Definitely. so it's not one of those showers that's going to clean you but uh you know again if you're planning on watching this meteor shower bear in mind that it will take at least 30 minutes for your eyes to adjust to the darkness so you got to give your eyes 30 minutes to be able to adjust to see in the darkness and uh, the longer that you're outside in the dark the better your vision uh, for the vision of the meteors will be and again they're recommending that the best time to be outside to catch the peak is between midnight and dawn and uh, there you go and it says that you won't need to look at any particular point in the sky to catch a glimpse of the shooting meteor they will be everywhere in the sky folks everywhere so yeah that'd definitely be something to check out for sure but uh, let's go back to today's guest um, he was a director or is a director not was a director he is a director and uh, it goes all the way back to his direct the hit from the time he started directing was in 1982 and he started with a film called One Dark Night. And then he did Jason Lives, Friday the 13th, Part 6. Then he did Date with an Angel. And then he did Stephen Banks Home Entertainment Center. Then he did the Stephen Banks Show. Sometimes they come back. Something to Live For. The Alice and Gert Story. Murder of Innocence. The Yarn Princess. Leave of Absence, Take Me Home Again, The Haunting of Helen Walker, Journey, A Different Kind of Christmas. Uh, that's a Christmas movie I hadn't seen. I'd really like to see. It's got Shelley Long in it. 
Then he did the third twin, Behind the Mask, Anna's Bell, The Unsaid, Murder in Greenwich, Fiona, DC Sniper, 23 Days of Fear, uh, She's Too Young, A Very Married Christmas, Odd Girl Out, Cyber Seduction, His Secret Life, Not Like Everyone Else, The Staircase Murders, Five the 5-5, five five, the Texas cheerleader scandal, the wrong man, at risk, and the front. So, yeah, he's definitely been involved with a lot of television shows and a lot of uh, mainstream films. There's even an earlier one that I had mentioned, or did you mention the, what black, I, what we're the talking, black Hole? No, because in The Black Hole, he was actually an actor. Oh, okay. And he played... Uh, uh, he, he acted in the black hole and then he uh, it, was like, it was another one back in the 70s that he did do you remember that one I really don't remember actually uh, did you know that he was actually nominated for an Emmy Award of course I knew that yep I'm saying that the audience may not know that okay yeah they may not know that but if you're any kind of fan of the friday 13th franchise as you know we've had darcy demoss on the show we've had cj graham and now we're bringing in the, the director tommy mclaughlin although a lot of people will say okay they know tommy from friday the 13th uh he's actually done sometimes they come back which was another that's a stephen king film and uh, he did that film, and uh, it's a very good horror film. So do you have anything else that you want to tell the people out there that we've been working on and uh, uh, sort of they can keep their eye out again? Like I said, we're still working on our books, and we're still working on getting uh, more uh, exciting guests for the Tickle Trunk of Horrors podcast. Yeah, we are uh, we got more uh, exciting guests coming up for you in the next month or so. Uh uh, over, uh, spread over the next month anyway so a lot of people from the horror franchises um, yeah I like to bring up something neighbors let's talk about neighbors for a minute there's actually a movie a horror movie I can't remember the name talking about neighbors where uh, these neighbors would invite uh, neighbors over and give them uh, chopped up uh, human remains but that's just uh, that came to light when I, I was thinking about neighbors because uh, not all neighbors are good neighbors and even though you try and be neighborly you can't always expect your neighbor to reciprocate and be yeah. a human being as well so be very careful on who you speak to I think and it's pretty sad this day and age where you you just can't be yourself because you ha you have no idea who you're speaking to well, yeah, we're dealing with a situation that right now with a lady that keeps pushing us and pushing us and pushing us. It's a lady that likes to walk her dog and have her dog shit in our yard. And so... Uh, very disrespectful. Very, very dis She intentionally does it. We've caught her doing it. And uh, she just keeps pushing and pushing and pushing. Then she likes to go around and sp spread gossip, gossip about us. And, uh, you know, to other neighbors and make us look like the villains when we're not actually the villains. And uh, something uh, needs to be done. I'm sure that that's uh, considered harassment, what she's doing. And so something can be done. But uh, we just got to make sure all the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted before we can uh, actually pull the harassment uh, deal. I mean, it's just sad uh, in today's age, day and age, where uh, you have people, like I said, like that like to push buttons and like to push their limits. It's just like a, a child, too. I mean, they'll continue to push boundaries and push their buttons until somebody puts a stop to it. So at the moment, she feels that she can get away with it. And, uh, you know, we have a dog as well. Very disrespectful. It just comes down to her being too lazy. She has two dogs. I mean, if you don't have the time or energy to walk your your dogs you know don't get a pet because it's not fair to the pet because pets are responsibility just like children are and if you don't have the time or you feel that you can't walk a few feet uh, you, it's really not fair and uh, again she's doing this intentionally and uh, at the moment we're just biding our time and making sure that we're going to respond 
correctly. Correctly, uh, very legally, correctly, uh, appropriately. And like I said, all the I's are being dotted and all the T's are being crossed. So, yeah. And it's very sad. I mean, I'll just touch on this ever so briefly because gossip and bullying, I mean, a lot of this is going on. And really, somebody that gossips about other people really does not have a life. And it's very sad that they have to create drama to get excitement in their life and involve innocent people and innocent people that are really minding their own business. Yeah, if, uh, you know, again, this lady has many places to walk her dog, and she chooses to walk it in our yard on a leash, and so there you go. She'll stand there with a, a sort of a stupefied look on her face like a zombie, even though we're standing right outside, and, you know, it takes a lot of balls uh, to be able to do that and think you can get away with whatever you feel like it. And then again, us in the situation that way that we live our life is we want to make sure that we respond to this appropriately and so uh, that's all I got to say about that so yeah appropriately being legally so yeah and uh, I hope all of you are surviving I know a lot of places around the world are in, in massive heat waves and uh, there's a lot of forest fires that are burning because even I've seen on the internet that the Yukon, way up in the Yukon, is battling forest fires uh, because of they're even in extreme heat where the world seems to be becoming a huge melting pot with uh, massive heat waves and people uh, breaking uh, heat records all over the world so make sure you stay hydrated and you keep cool because uh, the heat can become very dangerous yeah uh, <clears throat> matter of fact I talked to Ian Vero you know he was one of our guests on an earlier show that we've done and uh, Ian was telling me that this is the first cool day that they've had there in a long time there's been a stream heat where he's at he's over there in England that's so. in the UK and the yeah. UK I mean they get in the past the UK has gotten the odd you know a very very hot day but uh, now it's becoming you know they're in a massive heat wave even in Canada where my parents are they said this coming weekend it's going to be in the 34 35 degrees and that's that's hot I mean you're just in an air conditioning you're running your air conditioning 24 7 so they can't even make it to the lake and enjoy the outdoors because of the heat wave in their area as well and we notice that in this massive heat uh, bugs go crazy too so if you're dealing with bug problems these flies and what have you uh, again go crazy in the heat and uh, heat aggravates insects and bugs as well and if you have a pet make sure you're not tying your pet outside without a source of water because they have to be uh, sheltered from the heat as well yeah we, we live in a weird area and I say that because there was a dog it was a stray dog that was under another one of our neighbors uh, houses and the neighbor's house that it was under it stayed under there pretty much all the time a very peaceful dog very old dog and the neighbor was feeding it uh, and taking care of it because it was a stray and then his neighbor ended up uh, this this is not the neighbors by the way that we having the problems with this is a different neighbor uh, neighbors a few houses down his neighbor decided that they were going to call animal control and he made up some a lie saying that uh, the dog tried to attack him it was a real old dog uh, I've never seen that dog exhibit any aggressive behavior at all he only made up that lie just to get the dog uh, taken to uh, the pound. And very sad. I think it appeared to me, and I may stand corrected, that somebody probably had dumped the dog off because it is an elderly dog and they didn't want to take care of it. So the dog was here. I, you know, we, we were giving it water at one time as well. And, uh, you know, was very, very peaceful. peaceful. Dog. And, yeah. uh, you know, not bothering a fly. And uh, this person had to stick their nose in. Uh, uh, somebody else's business again and this dog unfortunately I I hope and pray it didn't get put down but uh, we all know when elderly dogs go to the pound what happens to them yeah exactly not very fair that's just a prime example of somebody uh, making up uh, BS or creating drama when they're you know there's enough drama in the world folks let's don't make up BS or make up drama yep let's not make up any of that stuff and so uh, there's a lot of gossip out there there's a lot of BS. Uh, we got a lying neighbor. 
who likes to gossip and uh, tell people lies, and uh, that's what she's very good at doing that. So. And like I said, it, it's a shame in this day and age when you can't truly be yourself and be friendly to people because you don't know how people can twist your words. And it's not like when I was a kid growing up where you could say hi, everybody said good morning to each other, and there was never a hidden agenda in what they wanted or people didn't say hi to you unless they wanted something from you. So I really wish for us, if we society could go back to those days where people could just be real, genuine human beings without a hidden agenda and uh, you know it's always me 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 all people worry about is themselves and uh, they really lack a sense of humanity and it's a shame that we really couldn't get that back yeah so Tommy may be calling us any minute now actually and so uh, like I said I got a lot of questions for him as far as Friday the 13th matter of fact here he is so I don't Hello, welcome to the Tickle Trunk of Horror Show. Is this Tommy McLaughlin? This is indeed. Hey Tommy, how you doing? This is Timothy with Alexandria. We're actually on the show right now. Oh, well, that's great. So, um, hello, everyone. Hello. So, so are y'all y'all having wildfires out there in California right now? Yeah, they're, um, actually they're pretty close to where I I teach film down in Orange County. Um, so that it's pretty pretty smoked out there. They're not threatened. Yet, but they're they're certainly in that vicinity and for very difficult uh, breathing. And uh, of course, in Northern California, it's been particularly devastating. Yeah, that's that's what we were just talking about. The heat waves is actually going on around the world right now in a lot of different countries, and uh, California seems to get hit every year. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's funny. I mean, of all the monster movies that I've made. Uh, I did a movie called The Fire Next Time, which is about global warming. And I've had people recently, you know, contact me about uh, the fact that when we did the movie, it was back in the early 90s. And we were projecting, like, a food 17 was going to be really particularly bad. Um, and I, I forgot that until they brought this up. And yeah, it's, it's all about the climate change and all the things that have occurred. And, that's just what we did in the movie was hurricanes and fires and uh, yeah, and, and basically in the middle of that was a family story of trying to survive through all this. So it's it, you know it's it's one of the scarier things that is going to affect everybody you know and continues to and so we you know try to see to turn things around and do something for our children's children. Wow, that's crazy how you predicted something that uh, actually came true there in your film. Yeah, well, the film, yeah, and, and the, the writers and the experts who, you know, we had involved in there, this, is, this was their this was their prediction, and I just had to kind of tell the story and, you know, humanize it so it was relatable at that time period, um, yeah. like anything else. I mean, you know, there are those who listen and there's those who don't, so we, we continue to, you know, hope for the best as, as we carry on. You know, uh, what we want to do uh, is we want to get to know... Tommy McLaughlin, we want to get to know you as far as like when you were growing up as a child. How uh like did was you was you a horror fan? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> much much to my mother's grief. Um, yeah, my mother had her eyes set on me being a priest, and so uh, she was a you know convert to Catholicism uh, for her wedding with my dad, who was actually lives in the seminary for a number of years and then decided that show business was far greater of a draw for him than being a, a, in the priesthood. So he had difficulties with his parents, you know, choosing that. And I was kind of having diff difficulties with my mother and that. Um, and then among that, I had this incredible devotion to the universal monsters. You know, Frankenstein, Dracula, the Wolfman, the Mummy, all those. Uh, which I saw basically on TV, but I guess I just had this kind of feeling that I was like that, that I was a loner, that I was, you know, uh, frightening, you know, I mean, just a lot of things that go through certain kids' minds, and you, you know, you, you sort of fantasize through those creatures where you have kind of a power, and, uh, it, you know, it, it was fascinating, you know, as a kid, uh, but then the big change happened when uh, the Beatles hit when I was about 12. 
all the way to like almost 1970, that was my life, was doing rock and roll, lead singer of a band, and uh, that, you know, and as much as I still went to horror movies and still loved it, it was, you know, it was secondary to the, you know, performing aspect on stage. Uh, then the strange thing was that to, to be a more interesting lead singer, I decided I needed to go beyond just dancing and, you know, doing crazy things on stage is I wanted to learn the art of lime. So I, I found out that the famous French lime artist, Marcel Marceau, had a school in Paris. So I took the only, like, straight job that I've ever had, working at a warehouse, got as much money as I could, and went to Paris in uh, 1970 to, uh, to study with him for a year, and then came back and became a street performer. You know, I had no money, but whatever I made in a hat from performing on the street is how I ate, how I paid the rent. And that, you know, kind of, there was a lot of little twists and turns with getting involved with Woody Allen on the movie Sleeper and being actually the monster in uh, the movie Prophecy and Captain Star and The Black Hole. All of that mind training led to these different movie roles, which eventually led me to writing, um, writing first these sketches that I was, you know, performing or when I was working on the Dick Van Dyke show, I wrote directed those physical comedy sketches, but now I, you know, ended up writing uh, a horror movie. So the kind of everything kind of turned around back to my childhood devotion and did a, a gothic horror film called One Dark Night. And that had a kind of a classic horror theme to it about the fear of death and uh, what happens if you get locked in a place that's all corpses and things, in this case a mausoleum. And, you know, that was kind of the beginning of what kind of took me into the world of being a horror uh, filmmaker. Hey, let me let me ask you this question. Going all the way back to uh, when you were saying that you were a uh, fan of the universal monsters, like the werewolf, Frankenstein, and, and Dracula, and the mummy, yeah. well, out, out of those four, uh, what was your uh, favorite? Oh, um, if I, could, I guess if I kind of work backwards, I'd say the mummy was my least favorite because I didn't quite identify with his background <laughs> at all. Um, and since uh, it, it was kind of a different culture, then they kind of, you know, they English or the Transylvanian. Um, yeah, I just recently actually found out in those DNA uh, researches that I have a lot of Romanian in me. I only 
Yeah, when you when you were talking about Friday the Thirteenth, uh, Jason Lives Friday Part Six. Um, I know y'all shot that that in a real cemetery in Covington, Georgia. Is that right? We shot yeah, we shot all the daytime stuff in a real cemetery, and then all the stuff that begins the movie where he's uh, you know digging up Jason and stuff. That that was all a created cemetery out in the field. See, so obviously we couldn't be out you know there digging up stuff and you know disturbing you know, people's loved ones. Um, so that, yeah, that was all actually created by uh, the art director. So that's actually, because when you say you used uh, the bolt of lightning to bring Jason back, that was awesome. That was what, I'm sorry? That was awesome. Just like you said, that was like oh. the way they did it in Frankenstein. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to come up with something. I mean, my when I got the job, the uh, executive on the on the series of films, Frank Mancuso Jr. just said, look, you know, we, we, we kind of screwed up on the last one, part five. We, uh, you know, the fans were not happy that it wasn't really Jason, you know, so we got to bring back Jason. So figure out a way to bring back Jason from, from the dead. And, um, you know, I understand you want to put comedy in it, just don't make fun of Jason. And I said, yeah, but so I'm going to keep him, you know, it's scary and now unstoppable and as can be, and, and at the same time, I said, you know, I'm going to, I think I'm just going to go back to my influences, you know, and be quite honest, you know, there's references in the movie to Karloff, and, you know, and there's a lot, in fact, a lot of the, you know, horror, uh, you know, legends, you know, Wes Craven, and, and uh, Carpenter, and Cunningham, all, there's all these little references through the movie, so I was trying to tell the audience Yeah, and you're Jason. Well, we had C.J. Graham on the show, and uh, he pointed. And I've been a fan of Friday the Thirteenth for a long time, and he pointed out something that I never realized: with uh, your Jason was the only Jason to have the utility belt. Yeah, what? The the utility belt with the knife. Let me ask you a question. Going to, going to another film that you did, uh, Sometimes They Come Back, the Stephen King film, uh, that car, where did you get that car from, from the uh, the 55 from for the film? Uh, uh, I believe most of the 
of those came out of from middle America there. We were shooting in Kansas City and, uh, you know, the, the transportation department, you know, brought in. We had three of those, actually, um, because, in, you know, in making films, you never know when one of them, especially having a, you know, a classic older car, you never know if you're going to have engine problems on the day when, you you know, you've got to shoot the car and have it racing down the road or whatever. So we had three of them, and uh, all of them were painted identical. And I believe that they, they just either got them from, you know, local, local guys in that area, or they put out, we didn't have the internet then, but put out some sort of call for anybody who has one of these that would like to be in, would like to have their car in this movie, you know, contact us. So, um, yeah, I, I can't think specifically other than, you know, I, I know they, they, they came from some, somewhere around Kansas. For myself, I know you had mentioned that you had studied uh, mime, and I'm, I'm quite fascinating because uh, fascinated with that because uh, really, uh, for those of the listeners that may not know what mime is, it's really using body movements, certain facial expressions, and different hand gestures. Did you find that studying mime helped you? Because I know I, I'm sensing an undercurring undercurrent theme of reanimation, rejuvenation, even reincarnation. Did you find that studying mine sort of helped you in creating that kind of themes in some of the films and some of the writing? A very, very good question. Yes. Um, and, and it also falls into um, D.W. Griffith who created, you know, pretty much people look at him as the first person to really create cinema film that told a story that was, you know, huge and, and something you never saw before um, in the silent days. And he, you know, he had a quote that, you know, that film was our first universal language because anybody, any place in the world, pretty much at any age, whether you were six years old or, or 80 years old, could watch a film in, in the silent days and understand exactly what was going on without any words. And the good films didn't have those title cards to read either. Um, they, they really told, you know, 95% of their, you know, story just by what you saw. So that whole idea of visual expression of what, you know, you see is what gives you a sense of what happens. And when I teach film, you know, I'm telling the, the film students, you know, a movie happens inside somebody's head, you know, you, it's an illusion, you know, you show, you know, a guy staring, you show a girl being scared, you show him, you know, a close-up of him withdrawing his knife, what happens? I mean, in your mind, you go, uh-oh, he is going to kill her. Now, we never said anything, whatever, the images and their reactions just tell us that. You know, in the same way, you know, you, it's, it's hard not to watch an image of a, a little boy you know, in a classroom and seeing his dad come back from Iraq and see that moment in his eyes when he sees it's his dad and he runs and they hug. You know, it's very hard for most people not to start to well up with tears. Again, it's it's not about what's said, it's about what's not said and how you emotionally react to that. So in studying mine, it really was that way of, you know, how do you convey things um, on a stage or in film? You know, that, that works, that everybody understands that moment. And, you know, it's, I try to get students, too, and anybody listening, you know, watch a lot of the, the really great movies, and you'll notice many times the whole, maybe the first 10 minutes, you know, there may not be, like, any words. I mean, A Quiet Place is an incredible example of that, how that begins, and the whole idea is don't make a sound, because these, these creatures hear you, or, you know, you're dead. So, I mean, that was an incredibly intense way to start the movie. So it is, the, the, the understanding of that, and for, you know, those of us who love films, you know, we find that, yeah, we're far more invested in something where we're, we're watching and hearing music and, you know, kind of being taken into that world. Hey, uh, Tommy, the, uh, uh, out of all the films that you've done, and I know that you've done television films and theater films, uh, what, what, excluding Friday the 13th, what would be your, uh, favorite film? Well, that's like, that to me, it's just my favorite child. Um, I can't really tell you this specifically was like the one, um, I always tell people, you know, the best film I, I think I have ever made is the one I haven't made yet. Um, because I've got so many things still rolling around in my head that I want to do. And, and yet, as I get older and other things become important, I find these things start to kind of change in terms of, no, you know, this would be more important than that. 
when I was leading up to wanting to make date with an angel, that was incredibly important to me because I, I love the movies of Frank Capra, you know, despite all this horror stuff we're talking about, you know, in my heart of hearts, I love a movie that encouraged people to be better people. You know, there was something very spiritual, you know, in Capra's work um, that one person can make a difference and the villains in life are going to be there and you're going to have to deal with them, but, you know, don't, don't lose your, human, your humanity and your caring and your family and all that. So those types of movies with a fantasy element, like It's a Wonderful Life had, you know, was what made me want to make date with an angel. We wanted that idea that, you know, if you're a good guy and something happened to you, in this case, you know, like a terminal disease, uh, God took, act, took care of you. And this, it, and this angel was kind of a, uh, a both romantic and fantasy, and then of course, a comic way of approaching that. So, as I said, leading up to that. Now, unfortunately, the company I did it for, they, they fell apart before the movie even got into the theater. So, it was very hard, you know, for the movie to, to open and find the audience that I was hoping it would find. And then there would be movies that I did that I didn't think, you know, were that important. I mean, they were powerful, like they did a movie called The Unsaid, with Andy Garcia, a, a feature film that, you know, uh, I was like going, well, I'm going to put everything I, I can into this, and it's a really unique father and son story, but when Andy and I went to the Dobell Film Festival in France, and it showed, I mean, it got a two-minute standing ovation because it had such an impact on people uh, what was kind of underneath that film so I go well that's that's wonderful but again it's like I said like your children there's one that you go you know I didn't think that one was that kid's going to do anything and they surprise you and then there's another one where you go I just loved everything about you know making this movie and the people and, and, and all that but ultimately it never really found an audience so you, you just don't know it's, it's you know I've got the same way as I'm asking what's my favorite film of all films that I've seen. It's like I, I have Scorsese's favorites, and, you know, and I've got, you know, Francis Ford Coppola favorites, and, you know, and so many of the young filmmakers coming up with their influences of the films of the 80s and 90s and seeing what they've done with some of the stuff that, you know, we were doing back then. So, yeah, it's a, I, I wish you could pick me down, but you really can't. There's just too many things I love for different reasons. Here, here's a question that I have for you, because I want to go to the music side real quick. The, because uh, you said growing up in the '60s that you're a member of a band. Uh, part one of the question is, what was the name of that band? And part two would be, uh, were you listening to the the Sloths back in the '60s? What was I listening to in the '60s? Yeah, well, I mean, what like your first band that you were in? What, what was the name of it? Uh, well, the very, very first band was called The Avengers, and that was basically like a surf rock group, and uh, I, I went to school with uh, the famous film composer, Henry Manzini, his son, Chris, and we put the first band together when we were 13, 14, and uh, we didn't really go any place with it, you know, we were, we were truly a garage band, we rehearsed and you know, Mancini's Garage, and, uh, you know, but that kind of, you know, got you know, the spark going, and then I got 
songs from uh, Junior Wells and Bo Diddley and Chuck Berry and you know, all, all that great early you know, 50s rock and roll. I had a quick uh, two-part question in regards to I'm fascinated with uh, mime performers, so I'm going to touch base on that because uh, Marceau, actually his white face character was Bip. So I was just wondering if you did your, when you did your busking on the street corner, if you had uh, a character and then part two of that question is that he's created probably about a hundred uh, pantomimes and if you had a, a particular favorite uh, pantomime and for those that are listening, uh, an example of one of his pantomime was the creation of the world in 1978. So that's part of a two-part question. Um, yeah, again, excellent question. Um, the, yeah, the, I had a character, not in the beginning, I did, I, I, when I first came back from Paris, I, I just kind of did anything that was sort of topical. Um, I had missed the big earthquake that we had in California when I was in Paris, so I did a pantomime about that, uh, you know, and, and a kind of, kind of a funny character. Um, I, I did a kind of a romantic man meets woman piece just using my hands that was somewhat you know, kind of similar to the creation of the world but in a much simpler fashion um, but as I continued to kind of work um, and I put together actually a group called the LA Mind Company uh, we all started to kind of create our own characters for that and I had a character that was kind of I guess the closest thing I could put it to is, is Goofy from the Disney he was Loping, he was not very smart, but he would always end up doing something that got him out of a problem in some kind of stupid way. And you know, I, it was a huge influence uh, from Jacques Tati, the, the French filmmaker. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people, you know, if you haven't seen his work, you should go back and look at it. Uh, Mr. Hilo's Holiday and My Uncle. There were some amazing films that he made in the '50s and early '60s that are basically worthless. You know, his character was like that, and yet he was a huge influence on me. So those the characters I did, you know, range from being, you know, cops and monsters and, uh, and and kind of just, you know, dumb, somewhere between a Buster Keaton and a Charlie Chaplin type, type character. And the LA Mind Company ended up going on a number of TV shows, uh, Don Kirshner's Rock Concert, you know, they, they took our sketches and kind of put them in between, you know, legendary rock and rollers. I'm sure on YouTube someplace there's some of those things that still exist uh, from Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. So you can kind of see, see me and see the sketches that I was writing in the LA Mind Company. And then Dick Van Dyke put us on his show, and I know those exist on, on YouTube uh, called uh, Van Dyke and Company. And there was one in there that I wrote and, and directed called the Great Robano Jr. that Dick did with two of the mind the members of the group, um, which is about a, a robot magician. And that seems to have had a you know great uh, comic effect on people over the years because it's like everything that can go wrong in a magic act, you know, with a, a dumb robot magician. So there's been a number of things that I've, I've kind of approached and just use mine. I have a new thing that I'm actually creating now that I, I haven't announced yet, but it's another, I'm using my mind again in a different live presentational fashion with a character that you would never imagine would be a mime. And oh. I don't want to spoil it yet, but it's, it, it, it'll, it'll probably by October or so, um, you know, you'll, you'll hear about it. It's uh, something that I've been working on for almost a year now. Sounds great. Are y'all, uh, is the Sloths working on another uh, album? Yeah, we just actually got offered, uh, we have, we were uh, picked up by uh, an agency in Germany of management and recording and distribution uh, just a few months ago. So they released our first album, Back From The Grave. Which again, there's that theme again, Back From The Grave. Um, you know, basically a bunch, a bunch of guys who, you know, were together in the 60s and now 50 years later when we're all in our 60s we're back rocking and rolling again and so the first album was released here in America on Burger label and then over there uh, it's on Eternal Records and they're going to you know help uh, fund this new album that we're doing 
like to recommend a club for you out there since that's my my home state is uh georgia uh yeah in athens georgia there's a club there called club chrome and if uh they they put on a lot of amazing live shows and uh uh, have a lot of great groups there, and I know they'd be great. glad to have y'all. I will, I'll remember that. Yeah, I've had a lot of uh, Athens, Georgia. It's interesting. I've had a lot of talented young actors come out of that that city um, because when I would be casting in, in Wilmington, North Carolina, you know, they would drive, or if they were younger, their parents would drive them from Athens all the way to Wilmington, you know, to audition, you know, for the different movies and stuff done there and I always thought you know it's such a shame they have to come so far you know to show what they you know can do because this was before you know videotape and things that you would send you know over the internet so you could audition somebody and see if they're any good this was you were really taking a chance to you know to come all the way out there and cost of gas staying overnight and things I mean it was you know huge devotion but it, it, it's funny because for some reason you know there was a number of people that I even cast in some of the shows that came from Athens. Let me ask you this question, because when you first started out in film, uh, you were actually in front of the camera, it seems like, and then in 82, you switched to behind the camera. Uh, was yeah. there was there a reason that you wanted to stay behind the camera? Yeah, it really got down to, um, the, you know, kind of taking the reality pill where, I, you know, I was writing and directing and going, you know, these guys can do stuff that I could never do. And it's not that I felt I could, you know, if I didn't work hard enough, I could do it, but I was suddenly in a new place in my mind where I wanted to create things and collaborate with people. You know, if you work with a, a you know, a terrific actor like, you know, Tom Matthews, um, or any of the cast members actually in Friday, um, you know, you, you give them something to do and they do it so much better than you would have done it. Um, and so I began to just hey, say, look, I love participating in watching somebody else do something that I gave them, you know, the line, or I gave them the story boring, or I said, you know, just say this like, you know, you love this person, but you don't want to admit it, yeah. you know, and so this is the way, you know, the line would come out, and I would sit there behind the camera and be totally entertained and totally, you know, delighted that, that, that they had this gift that, that I didn't have. So it just became this sort of like, hey, let's, let's you know, do this in a way that everybody gets a chance to be part of the team. And it was so much more fun, you know, as a, as a creator to, to not have to just do it, you know, everything by yourself as I did as a mind where I wrote it, I directed it, I was the only person on stage, you know. Um, but as the years have gone on now, I've kind of come back into acting again. I, um, I was just in a, in a movie called Rock Steady Row. Uh, that's uh, where I play a very strange uh, <laughs> body collecting janitor at a futuristic college uh, that's starting to play the film circuits now. And there's another film that's going to be doing uh, in Austin. I don't know the title yet. Um, and, and as I mentioned, the mind thing is coming up that I'm going to be you know, performing and of course on stage with the band. It, um, you know, it's very much about performing within within the songs, you know, doing characters, I do costume changes, use props, magic, you know, what I learned as a kid is all now part of the rock and roll thing. So I sort of balance the two things now or three things, you know, teach film or share it with, with young students, still write, still direct, and now kind of got back to performing as well. And it, you know, keeps me busy. I think uh, I myself, I was born an empath and I mean, I'm, I'm a highly spiritual uh, person. That's the way I was brought up with uh, my grandfather being an Indian shaman. But I think what I get from you is that you're a highly spiritual person. And I think having that ability has allowed you, and you may correct me, allowed you sort of to uh, present almost a buffet of the senses in every performance, whether it be a writer, actor, it's allowed you to portray that to to people out there. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I I have to be humble to say that I'm not, you know, necessarily special, but I, I always do, and I pass on to my children as well, is that, you know, God puts us down here for a reason, and we 
have the responsibility of finding out, you know, what is what is our responsibility? What is what is it the thing that we have a gift towards that 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 somebody else might not have in the same way? And how you reach out and touch one another and leave something, you know, behind after you know you've left here that meant something. And it can be as simple as, you know, a father grandfather's relationship with his granddaughter and just the way he takes care of her and she goes on the rest of her life going, you know, I'm so happy I had that relationship with my grandfather. It just made me feel so much better about life. Or it could be somebody who's, you know, Billy Graham and touches hundreds of millions of people in his life and in terms of it's just a straight out, you know, spiritual message. But I think just the whole idea that, you know, we're here to make this place better and to and make us as human beings feel, you know, both, you know, what's what's honest and what's real. And then also just the escape of entertainment, something that makes you laugh, something that makes you afraid, something that makes you feel. Um, it's not so crucial. And I mean, I know whether I go to church on Sunday and I hear a great sermon or I go and see a movie and it has a great theme or it has a great character that I can relate to. I can't tell you how much of my life has been saved because of a couple of images from Rocky but watching him just hang in there and just that message of it's not necessarily winning the fight. It's like staying there, you know, going the distance, you know, wanting to make sure you're still there and you did your best and you, you know, you, you didn't give up. And those basic things really, I think, are important for all of us to keep realizing because it is, it is tough sometimes, beyond tough. And it's, you, you have to reach inside of yourself and find something that, that gives you that strength to keep going. Well said. I, I think that's very important in your, your huge body of work, whether it be screenwriting, films, mime, you are portraying that message and you will be leaving a legacy of, of a huge body of work to be proud of. And I think that's really amazing that, you know, even with mime in the school, that you're, you're teaching people to how really express themselves without having to use verbal expression. And I think that if you can do that, that is a rare gift and you have that gift. Well, well thank you. I mean, I hope so. I mean, this is what, I'm, you know, 68 years on this planet basically has kind of, you know, emphasized to me that that's so important and what I constantly keep going back to in my uh, sermonizing, you know, both on stage about, you know, don't give up, you know, your dreams. Because here I stand, you know, holding a record album showing you something that I wanted to do 50 years ago and we finally got a chance to do it. It, it didn't happen when we thought it was going to happen, but it happened, you know, when, when it was right to happen. In the same way, you know, when I have uh, young directors approach teams that they're directing, you know, constantly reminding them, look for where the love is. You know, these characters are having issues with love. Either they love this person and the other one doesn't love them, or they're so upset that they never had love and they act out in appropriate ways. But there's this, it always gets back to either the most beautiful and, and positive aspects about love or the darkest and most nasty aspects when you feel like you don't have it and it's constantly you know that back and forth of, of how do you you know how do you deal with those those incredible emotions that come in that category of love well tommy I, uh we're running out of time here is uh and, and I, I do appreciate the message that you shared with everybody out there today um yeah well as a, as a former mime i talk too much but you know i guess it was all those years of of silence that you know, <laughs> yeah. to discuss something I, I i'd love to talk about it no nah, man we appreciate it you've been a great guest and uh y you know was, i'd like to see you direct the next if if sean and victor can come together on a deal it would be great to see you do the next friday the 13th well i'm i'm heading in that direction but yeah like as you say it's like those, those those two boys gotta gotta work it out between them or somebody's gotta come along with such a huge bag of money and say look everybody's gonna come out of this really good let's just you know move on um but i hope you know whatever that next friday is it's, it's a good one and, and it's not gonna be disappointing because the fans have waited so long for it and, you know, I certainly have my ideas of what it should be, and I'm sure there's plenty of other ones, but, um, you know, we'll see, you know, as it goes down. And, um, you know, I'm probably just excited, as excited as 
excited, if not more so, for all the fans with the next Halloween coming out, bringing Michael Myers back, which is going to be, you know, very interesting for for all of us horror fans to see, uh, you know, with John Carpenter's, you know, hand in it, you know, what they're going to do with uh, with that one. Yeah, I, th- I think this is the 40th anniversary for them, and I, and that's what I was about to say. We're coming up on the 40th, 40 year anniversary for Friday the 13th uh, in the next couple of years. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, without without Michael Myers, there wouldn't have been Jason or so many of the other mask you know killers over the years. And uh, so you know, to me, it's always a guy point back and giving a nod to Michael Myers and say, you know, that was that was the one that inspired so many people and in fact it was so successful of course it was very easy for business people to say yeah let's make them let's make one like that so it, 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 you know without that i don't think sean or a lot of the people would have been able to be as uh, you know well off financially as they are today if it wasn't for you know the success of halloween and I hope in the future that with your huge talent that you're able to do a, a mime something to do with mime with a horror twist to it because I think that would be totally kick-ass well you're, you're, I, you're gonna get your wish <laughs> awesome. I guess you're, I you're just, you know you, 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 hit, you hit a bonnet there oh but you'll see okay awesome yeah. All right, Tommy. It's been good having you, and uh, we'll 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 send the appropriate links when everything's wrapped up. Okay, great. Thank okay. you so much. You guys have been such a pleasure. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Have we're a really, great day. Really Thank appreciate you. It. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Have a great day. Hey, you, you too. too. Bye. Okay. Bye. So that was Tommy McLaughlin. Uh, apparently, he's coming out with a mime horror movie, which. Uh, he said you hit the nail on the head there so that was an awesome interview awesome guest uh we'd really like guests that can talk we we could have talked for i think for hours with all of his projects and his insight his a little bit of a philosophy thrown in there i don't know if everybody was listening to the comedy show that was going on i don't know if everybody can hear that hear it uh when when the show actually hits but uh Man, we, we've had so much background noise today on this show that uh, hopefully I'm able to eliminate the uh, majority of that anyway. So, but, but yeah. What an awesome guest. And like I said, uh, we are very thrilled to have him take time out of his super busy schedule to fit us in. And it was such an honor. That's it. Talk take to care. Bye-bye.